Hi, this is Kevin. Welcome to my lecture on uh, Chapter 2 from the Spurrier and Topi uh, text. Chapter 2 is about identifying opportunities for business transformation with IT. Uh, the chapter begins with learning objectives for the chapter, and I'm going to leave those for you to read on your own. Um, so this uh, chapter is pretty big picture, okay? We do talk about some uh, individual activities a systems analyst might do, but um, it kind of answers the question, um, how do you find projects? You know, how does an organization decide which projects uh, to work on? And how do they choose amongst project opportunities uh, and those kinds of things, right? So it's kind of big picture that way. And to be an effective systems analyst, it's probably true that you aren't on an everyday basis faced with these um, you know, kind of high level problems or involved in these high level discussions. But um, understanding these principles in this kind of language um, gives you the opportunity to take whatever activity that you're doing as a systems analyst um, and bring it back to uh, principles that are very important for the organization. Uh, and that allows you to make sure that whatever project you're formulating or, or you're working on um, uh, has a healthy relationships to the objectives of the organization um, in a way that your project is going to be successful. Okay? So, um, uh, on a very basic level, it's important that a project, either the one that you're working on, or one that you're evaluating, or one that you're proposing, it's important that they be, um, that any IT project um, is going to help whatever organization you're working for achieve its uh, goals. And these happen in three primary ways. Uh, one, you you have a project that's going to increase the top line revenues or other key outputs of the organization. Okay, so it's going to make the organization measurably, measurably more successful. Uh, top line revenues is the kind of measurement of success that you would have for um, a for-profit enterprise. OK, uh, for a not for profit enterprise, you'd probably be trying to measure some other key outputs that everybody would agree or most people would agree are um, the way to measure the success of that kind of organization. Um, another thing that you can do is you can increase bottom line uh, profits, which is to say, you're not going to bring in more business or activity, but you're going to make, um, you're going to allow the organization to be more efficient so that the activities that they are doing cost less and uh, there's more uh, profit left at the end of the accounting uh, period, say the year. Or, um, again, if we're working for a not-for-profit, maybe we don't want to profit on the bottom line, but we want to make sure that we get the most of those key outputs that we're measuring um, for, um, you know, for the resources that we're using up, for the budget that we have. Uh, okay, so... Um, Include increasing the bottom line profits um, has a way that that it comply even to 
not-for-profit enterprises. You just have to change the phrasing. And stay in business. And by that, we're really talking about, um, oh, there might be regulatory uh, compliance. There may be pressure from uh, competitors. There are all kinds of uh, risks in the environment that threaten the organization that we're working with. And uh, there's just some practicalities of be able, being able to address those risks um, that could be addressed by IT projects. Uh, let's talk about increasing the revenue. Um, so uh, uh, it typically... Uh, we're not going to be working with an organization that has IT products and services, right? It has some other kinds of products and services, right? So uh, how could we increase their revenue or, uh, you know, whatever they're bringing in? Uh, we could improve a product or service quality, okay? And that could make it more attractive um, to buyers. Uh, we could add or improve product or service features. So, or uh, we could create a whole new product or a service. Um, and uh, uh, just to follow on there, we could create a whole new product or uh, service. So in terms of bringing more revenue into the organization, uh, we could take the things that we have and make them more attractive to customers, um, or we could um, we can create new things we didn't have uh, before, products or uh, services, uh, get the attention of customers, and of course they're going to pay us, and that's going to bring the revenue in the door. Uh, or um, Probably if we're already in the business of selling software or IT services, uh, we could sell those ourselves, right? So uh, we could have an IT project that creates, you know, some software or a service and we could sell licenses. We could, uh, we could get fees for uh, selling software as a service. Uh, we could have... Uh, continuing annual maintenance uh, fees. We could do those kinds of things. Um, and, or we could increase ad revenue by giving away the IT uh, product. If you look at a lot of, uh, a lot of services on the internet, um, you know, say uh, Google, right? Um, uh, it, Google doesn't uh, charge the searchers for searching, uh, but while they're giving away the searching, they do a lot of advertising. Uh, and they take the searching data and they either capitalize on it themselves or they rent that data out to, to uh, uh, customers who want to buy that data. Uh, and so by creating an IT service, um, and giving it away to the primary user, uh, they still are able to generate a revenue stream from people like advertisers. Um, or maybe what can be done with this IT related uh, project is that we can increase the efficiency of the organization that we're working with. So um, we could use uh, fewer hours of labor per unit of uh, product or uh, service, or we could use fewer uh, units of some material that we're using. You know, we're making uh, uh, we're making cars, you know, and we're making them from st 
steel and plastic and glass and all those things. Perhaps our IT solution will use less of those uh, materials, okay, and reduce the cost, make us more cost efficient, right? Um, uh, a potential way we can do it, and it, it's really hanging off the last of the bullets here, maybe our IT system will just allow us to reduce the waste in the materials that we're using. Uh, maybe we cut the materials in a pretty inefficient way, and maybe we're going to have a system solution that kind of plans out the cuts of the raw materials, uh, and so that the waste is reduced by 10% uh, or uh, something like that. That could be a really big savings. Uh, otherwise, staying in business. Okay, so there are some things that we have to do, not because we're going to sort of increase the top line, we're going to bring in more revenue, and not because we're, we're going to uh, increase the bottom line, uh, which is to uh, improve the profitability uh, through efficiencies, but because there is uh, something that is a threat and it might cause our organization to blink out. Okay, so one big thing is uh, regulatory compliance. Uh, maybe we, maybe we have to do some kind of reporting to the federal government. Uh, maybe we have to do some kinds of audits, right? Uh, maybe we have an obligation to protect uh, privacy and security. Uh, especially, say, for personal financial information. Uh, and if we don't, uh, we'll get very big fines, okay, which, which could cause our company, uh, you know, to blink out. Or I say company, but, you know, whatever organization that we have. Um, uh, the last couple of bullets uh, kind of go... Uh, to this. Uh, we live in a world that's changing all the time and uh, competitors are adopting uh, IT enabled solutions all the time. Um, there may be times when we need to do some kind of project like this just to keep up with the competitors. Uh, okay. Um, the customers of our organization can either get their goods and services from us or from a competitor. A competitor has some sort of IT-driven innovation. Uh, we have to match it or we're going to lose all of our customers, right? Um, so um, it's been quite a while since um, at the people who lead organizations um, and the consultants who advise them have been aware that we can take IT-oriented projects and make significant improvements in the circumstances for the organization. And one of the biggest, um, uh, one of the earliest uh, kind of pushes of this uh, type was uh, one that came that came around in the 1990s, and it was called business process reengineering. Um, and this is something I was actually pretty close to. Um, this is really pushed by uh, kind of management consulting firms, and their their idea was that uh, they could come in and work with your senior management uh, team and they could figure out a way to uh, just kind of re-engineer re the way that you do your business. Um, and they would look at, oh, kind of all the activities that you did and they would look uh, particularly at 
were there any uh, IT related te technologies that would allow you to do these activities say completely differently uh, and get uh, get a real advantage over your uh, competitors? Um, and they would come into organizations and they would have these really big uh, business uh, process reengineering uh, projects, uh, BP or as we called it. Um, and some of them were very successful and some of them were atrociously unsuccessful. Um, there were some companies that tried to do this that just drove themselves right out of business. Um, and there were lots of, you know, results in between. So uh, I think this movement, this uh, BPR movement, was um, is really significant because it's probably the first the time that um, in you know the popular business imagination we had this idea that you could you could take IT and and make changes in your business and and really really have a big impact not just marginal impact but a, a revolutionary impact and uh, I think it was uh, on the whole a disappointment uh, but it's probably more significant that it 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 raised people thinking about uh, how IT projects could um, could change the way that you do business uh, maybe we have a lot more examples of how new companies have 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 adopted kind of IT solutions um, in order to you know sort of recreate the way that we think about a market. Um, you know, it, it, companies like Uber and Lyft in the you know the transportation side or uh, companies like Amazon in the, the retail side or uh, yeah, companies like um, Verbo and um, um, <laughs> I'm forgetting the name now so I apologize for that but companies uh, who are renting uh, uh, properties uh, uh, for two uh, vacationers and those uh, kinds of, of things. Um, there was a, a there were a, some further formal approaches to IT driven organizational change. Um, they came up in the around uh, 2000, and the authors talk about uh, business process management, modeling, and design. Um, I've, I've got less uh, firsthand experience with those kinds of projects, so I'll leave you to read those in the text. And this uh, digital uh, transformation, which is, uh, you know, the kind of things I'm talking about with, uh, you know, Uber and Verbo and Amazon. Um, these are, th are things that uh, began to happen in the 2010s through the 2020s. But the fact is, um, I think that this... Uh, you know, this kind of thinking that big changes were possible and could be driven by IT, uh, it really has its roots back in um, some of the things that people wanted to, to accomplish in the 90s when they were trying to do these business process reengineering things. It may turn out that if you're going to do a big uh, kind of change in your approach to a business, it helps to be a startup. Okay, uh, perhaps it's hard to, um, you know, to make drastic uh, changes in existing organizations. Uh, I think that's a lot of what wrong with, with, 
what went wrong with uh, the BPR stuff and the reason that we had a few successes and a few uh, big uh, failures and a lot of, you know, kind of ugliness in between. Um, how can IT impact the organization? Okay. Uh, in the text, they talk about four different things that can be impacted by IT. Uh, it can impact your business model. It can impact your strategy. It can impact your tactics, and it can in, impact your operations. Uh, so strategy-wise, uh, most organizations of any appreciable size have a formal strategic planning process. Um, and um, the diagram that we see here uh, kind of shows what are some of, of the kind of inputs that organizations look at when they formulate the organization strategy. Uh, and they say, well, they look at the environment that the organization's in. They look at organizational resources. They look at the values that the organization uh, either has or aspires to. Um, they look at some, uh, some expression of the mission and the vision of the organization. Um, and they, look, they try to identify... Uh, sort of agreed upon high-level goals. And they have some kind of process of uh, uh, people meeting and talking and revising and reviewing and giving feedback. And they come up with a strategy, right? And um, uh, once they have a strategy, well, then they have to decide... Um, exactly how they are going to implement that. And what we're seeing here is that, uh, at least according to the authors, is that you have to decide uh, what your business model is going to be. And a business model is a fairly vague thing, but it includes things like, what kind of customers are you going to sell to? Uh, how are you going to sell to them? Are, 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 are you going to... Are you going to uh, knock on doors? Uh, are you going to advertise on TV? Are you going to do? Um, are you going to place ads on uh, Facebook? Um, what kind of uh, what kind of pricing are you going to have? Are you going to be a high quality, high priced uh, product or service? Or are you going to be a highly discounted, low-cost uh, service. Um, uh, where are you going to sell your goods and services? Are you going to sell them in just one local market? Or are, are you going to sell them uh, uh, nationally in the United States? Or are you going to sell them internationally, potentially all over the world? So that was those kind of mixtures of those decisions about how you're approaching your business, they all add up to kind of a business model. And you have to pick one, okay? You're probably not going to pick one that's very far from the one you have right now, but it maybe it represents a bit of a shift, okay? Uh, so it looks here that they've gone for business model option two, Okay, and then for that, you have to come up with a set of tactics, okay, um, that are going to implement business model two, okay? And then from that, you have to come up with a bunch of operational uh, decisions that are aligned with uh, the tactics. Uh, if you've uh, decided to... Uh, get into a market, well, then you have to implement that. If you decided to get out of a market, well, then you have to Im implement that. If you've uh, decided to change uh, the way that you sell to people, you have to implement that. If you decided you're going to change your pricing or uh, the, you know, the geography that you serve, well, then you have to implement those. Um, 
so uh, it, it, down in the end, uh, you have all these things that are going on in your organization, uh, and um, you're going to want to change uh, some of those. You're going to want to hire people. You're going to want to fire people. You, you, you know, you're going to want to uh, institute new policies. You're going to want to abolish old uh, policies. Uh, you're going to, you know, you may want to build factories. You may want to close other factories. So it's just all those kinds of things. That's what we mean by make operational decisions aligned with uh, tactics. Okay, and by the time that we get down to these operational uh, decisions, some of these are enabled by IT. Okay, um, if we have some operations that we're going to close, well, we're you know we're going to have to find a way to turn off all the systems that they use and perhaps find some way to mothball their data. Uh, if we're going to open up a new division, it's going to need a complete set of IT things. Um, if we're going to, if we decided that we want to sell, um, if we decided that we want to sell um, things online, you know, we want to have e-commerce. Well, then we need to build a whole e-commerce platform. Okay, so uh, in relation to IT projects, it's really when you come down here to the to the last thing that um, that the projects really come into focus. And one of the one thing I, I think that we're trying to emphasize here is that these. Um, these kind of IT related projects that happen, they don't happen in a vacuum. Ideally, they you can back all the way up to a strategy that the, the organization has adopted because of something that they saw in the world uh, that surrounds them. Um, so um, a one uh, strategic planning approach um, uh, is called SWAT, okay? And uh, what you do uh, in relation to this uh, kind of left-hand uh, box is you take the participants in the strategy and you look at, uh, it's S-W-O-T, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. So you look at the strengths of your organization. You look at the weaknesses of your organization. You look at the opportunities in the environment. You look at the threats in the environment. And then you try to come up with a strategy and a set of tactics that um, build on your strengths, protect you the best you can from your weaknesses, capitalize on opportunities, um, and defend against uh, threats, right? So, um, so that's what you do if you're operating your organization thoughtfully, right? So uh, here's the kind of takeaway for the systems analyst. Uh, at least in theory, um, an organization that you're working for as an employee or that you're approaching as a consultant, um, they have this kind of strategic planning and thinking process, okay? And then there are all kinds of projects that they can do. And if you want to be really successful and help them be successful, you should come to see how whatever particular proposed projects, how they relate back to um, the tactics that the organization is trying to pursue and what business model those uh, tactics enable uh, and why that business model is consistent with their strategy. And if you really want a lot of insight, well then how that relates to 
you know, the strengths, the weaknesses, and the opportunities and the threats that surround the organization. Now, do you have to understand all those things in order to propose a project or advocate for a project? No, you don't really have to. But to the extent that you do, you increase the chances that you're going to be associated associated with a winner project where when you propose it or you advocate for it, uh, people in the organization are going to be inclined to say, uh, yes, Kevin, that's what we should do. I want to go with that project that you're proposing. So that's how all this stuff relates to kind of the everyday job of the systems analyst. Um, they talk in the text about this um, scheme uh, promoted by uh, the author, author Leffingwell and uh, others. Uh, that's called a, called a scaled agile framework. And this is a way of saying, um, how could you take the things that IT does and how'd you, how could you go from a very strategic uh, point of view to individual uh, individual projects are being being pursued by individual teams and they uh, came up with a three level framework where at the very top uh, you have a portfolio of projects that uh, the organization has to decide uh, where it can best spend its IT dollars okay and then um, from that uh, we come up with programs, okay? And uh, programs, uh, typically in the project management world, are uh, uh, two or more projects pursued in a coordinated way to, to create the best benefit for the organization. So uh, we have a portfolio of IT investments, and then we come down to programs that the organization has committed to. And then, then we come down to individual projects um, that are being pursued by teams. This is an interesting idea, but uh, uh, frankly, it seems kind of academic to me and from my my experience being kind of a systems analyst on the ground, uh, I don't see how that, how this point of view is more helpful than the point of view from the prior slide. The, the point of view from the prior slide, I, I think, gives you a, a kind of a useful big picture view. Uh, perhaps I sell... Uh, scaled out agile framework a little short but um it doesn't appeal to me it might appeal to you though okay i mean these are real people these are real ideas and if you find a way to get inspired by this uh model uh, uh great tell me about it maybe you'll bring me around um <clears throat> Each potential IT project uh, needs some upfront work. And in this uh, context, we're calling this initial visioning. Okay, so um, we have to decide if a potential project is worth pursuing. Okay, uh, so uh, what would we do? What would that activity look like? Would that be done by a systems analyst? Well, it might be done by a systems analyst. It might be done by a project manager. Uh, it might be done by somebody who has both of those kinds of background. But because a systems analyst um, primarily understands uh, uh, the systems analyst has to understand the problems that the client wants to solve or the opportunity that they want to capitalize on 
and they have to be able to envision a system solution that will either solve the problem or capitalize on the opportunity right and then they have to be able to express the functionality of the system such that the potential users can understand how they would use that system in order to get the job done and get the benefits okay a systems analyst is 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 a good person it's a good role for this initial visioning activity okay so um what would you do well you would develop a brief description of the problem or opportunity that sounds like pros okay uh you'd outline the business benefits okay and remember the benefits that we're talking about are you know increasing the revenue decreasing the cost uh meeting uh challenges that perhaps are hard to justify in terms of revenue or cost but um they're kind of threats to the organization uh things that are either regulatory things that we have to comply with or um, competitive uh, challenges that we have to meet okay uh, and then we need to perform an initial analysis of the feasibility of the project okay and this is kind of vague but the idea is uh, does this really seem like something is going to work okay and do we have a list of the kinds of feasibilities here? Uh, we don't. So in terms of feasibility, um, there's a whole list in the book, and, and I think it's a, a good list. Um, uh, um, is this project um, financially feasible? Okay, which is to say, whatever funds it's going to take to do it does the organization have them is it economically feasible um does it increase revenue or reduce uh cost uh is it legally feasible okay is our organization legally entitled to do the things that we would like to do is it politically feasible um uh uh our uh, kind of values and uh, beliefs uh, within our organization consistent with what we want to do or are we going to get voted down is it technically feasible so when we're talking about feasibility we mean all these things not just is it uh, technically uh, feasible we're talking about that whole uh, constellation of things that's pretty well discussed in the textbook um so the outcome of this initial visioning activities is going to determine whether we try to take this forward right um so uh what we really have here is uh, uh on this slide we're trying to formalize the thinking of do we have a real project here okay if we're working internally okay for our employer okay we we might do we might uh, talk to people about these things and write up a uh, a document and present it to them and see if they agree with us um, uh, and go ahead with the project or if we're a vendor uh well then you know we might have some kind of a proposal letter in which we are uh, proposing to do this uh, project and we're trying to capture these kind of thoughts in our proposal letter okay um uh, what would happen now well if we believe that this project is is a winner and we ought to go ahead with it uh well then we propose it and we hope that the decision makers are going to agree in which case we would go on to do uh, more planning of uh, the project. Um, so, oh yeah, a, a purpose of initial visioning. So let's see what they have here that I've already said. 
uh, communicate the project's underlying idea to all the relevant stakeholders. The stakeholders are interested parties, okay? Ensure that the proposed project is aligned with the organization's overall strategy and long-term plans for IT, uh, okay? Uh, again, it's a lot more likely that people are going to see this as a viable project if it ties back through the tactics in, into the, the strategy, okay? Ensure that there is a reasonable likelihood that the project will meet its outcome expectations and an acceptable cost level. So that's, uh, you know, kind of operational feasibility, economic feasibility. Uh, ensure that the project will not lead to unacceptable risks. That's kind of economic feasibility, uh, technical feasibility. And secure the necessary resources, people and money, for the next stage of the project. So um, this visioning becomes our pitch to the decision makers that we should go ahead and either they're going to give us the people and the money to go ahead or they're not depending upon um, whether they believe in our uh, pitch um, so uh, what would we do if we got the money and the people well, we would work on documenting the business processes. That's the rest of this uh, chapter. Um, they, they think that we ought to think about key concepts. That's in chapter three. Uh, they think that we ought to think about user stories. That's documenting the functionality of the system. They have that in uh, chapter four. Um, and they think that we ought to think about user experience and user interface. Uh, they say that's in chapter four here, here, but I don't think it really is in chapter four. It's in another uh, chapter. I think this is a uh, typo, right? So, the, the, so these are all ways in which we could use the information that's in the textbook to move ahead um, and get the planning and the execution of this uh, project uh, done. Here's where all the information is in the remainder of the book. Um, key actions in business analysis. Discovery, structuring, and transformation. Uh, okay. Uh, discovery is a really important thing. We need to find out the facts regarding the current way in which the organization conducts its uh, business. Uh, okay, because uh, we need to understand the problem or opportunity. So if you look at the way that we currently uh, conduct uh, ourselves within this organization, and in this book we say uh, business, but don't, don't get turned off by that if you're not in for-profit enterprises, okay? We just mean the day-to-day -day activities of our organization, okay? So there's either a problem there or there's an opportunity, okay? And if we're going to understand the problem or the opportunity, we need to know something about the details of what we do within our organization on, on a day-to-day -day basis. Structuring. Presenting the findings of discovery in a, a systematic, consistent, and easily understandable way. And transformation, it, determining how to change the way that the organization conducts uh, business. Uh, now, I'm going to be, I'm going to say that this is a nice way of thinking, okay? But I'm going to warn you that there's a trap uh, here, okay? Um, uh, there have been a lot of approaches to systems analysis uh, that kind of work like this. Once we know we're going to uh, we're going to be working on this, we've decided it's a feasible thing to do. Um, 
we have this idea that it's kind of a three-part process, okay? Uh, first, we document what's currently being done, okay? And in some of these approaches, we spend a lot of time and money uh, kind of mapping out how things are done currently in the uh, current organization. And we'll get to that in a slide or two. We'll call, the, call that the current state, okay? Then we'll go and we'll map out how we would like them to be in the future state. Okay, and again, we're going to document in detail uh, how things are going to work in the organization and in the systems of the organization in the future, future state. And then implicit in those is that the difference is the transformation that has to go on. Okay, now that's very appealing intellectually. Okay. Unfortunately, it's a times consuming approach, right? Uh, and the, they're not exactly saying this on uh, slide 16 here where we are, but they're headed that way. And I can tell you from experience that these, these um, very systematic approaches where we document a lot of what's currently going on and then we document a lot more even about what's going to go on in the future and then we try to figure out the chances that have to go on um you can get lost in the details of that okay so that's my warning more soon uh so the focus that they want to to have us do is this thing called business process modeling uh, and the tool that they want us to use to do it uh, uh, is this uh, uh, kind of diagram called activity diagrams and uh, in the current teaching of of my course and again we're in the fall of uh, 2021 uh, we're not going to use activity diagramming for this use. Now, in a subsequent uh, semester, I, I may backtrack on that. So um, uh, I mean, there are plenty of people who do it. And when we learn a little bit more about activity diagrams, you can really see that they're helpful. Uh, so we're going to use activity diagrams in uh, oh, a couple of chapters down the road when we're working on use uh, cases but you can use activity diagrams for business process modeling uh we're just not going to take the time to do it in the current semester uh okay so um what is an activity diagram well there's a set of diagrams uh that are part of this uml this uh unified modeling language that came out of um, object-oriented software uh, development and um, it's a really powerful uh, diagram uh, and um, I really like activity diagrams uh, and one of the nice things about um, UML is that it came out of a, a bunch of people in the systems world wanting to have some kind of commonality in the way that they express themselves. Uh, prior to this, um, a lot of thoughtful people had their own versions of diagrams. And it was sort of like a diagram tower of Babel, you know. Um, so uh, they made a common cause and they agreed on this uh, UML. And the UML has... I don't know, 10 kinds of diagrams, 14 kinds of diagrams, uh, something like that. Um, it depends on, on how, how, found you, how, how finely you slice up the UML. Uh, but um, um, activity diagrams are really useful uh, things. So they say that the purpose of this business process modeling with activity diagrams is articulating activities and specific rules for control and object flows 
is specify the way in which an organized group of actors, typically human beings, typically systems users, uh, act to achieve a goal. So let's go see some more. So what are the symbols that are used on these activity diagrams? Well, uh, the most common one is activity. So this is some activity that's going to go on either manually, okay, a person's going to do it, or it's going to go on in, uh, uh, it's going to go on in the uh, uh, system. So there are some activities that are done by uh, people, and there's some activities that are done by uh, systems. Well, in fact, let's just go look at an activity diagram, and then we'll come back to this um, uh, uh, page. So let's look at an activity diagram. Yeah. So an activity diagram, uh, this uh, symbol says that we start, and this, this says that we end. And it says that we enter the store, we get a cart or a basket, we collect items to purchase, we scan items for payment, we make the payment, we exit the store, we're done. Okay, so what kind of activities are these? These seems like the kind that humans do. Okay, so there'd be a human actor who'd be doing those, not a system actor. Okay, uh, and you can see that we have these activity uh, symbols uh, for the actions that go on. And we have these arrows uh, right here. They're more or less showing just a sequence. Uh, okay, I guess it's a little bit implicit that, um, you know, that we get the cart or basket and then, uh, you know, we have it later and that we... Um, we uh, collect the items and then we have them when we have to scan. But there's no real flow of objects being implied here. Okay. Um, let's get to a little more uh, complicated one. Uh, we can show decisions. Right. So we can say uh, we enter store. Uh, we verify access to payment, okay, and then if we have access to payment, then we go uh, and then we start down uh, that thing that we're going to do. But if we don't have access to payment, we're done. Okay, all right, we could say that. Um, uh, now, we could talk a little bit more. Here, we've kind of enhanced the diagram to say which actor is doing all of these things. So the customer enters the store, the customer it verifies this. So you can kind of see these are all being done by the customer. They're not being done by the system. Okay. Uh, what some more uh, symbols. One of the nice things about activity diagrams is you don't have to do everything in sequence um, in series, they often say, but you can do some things in parallel, okay? And so what we're doing here is that we're going to split into two sets of parallel activities, okay? And then we're going to, um, we're going to do them both at the same time, and then we're going to sync here, and then we're only going to continue on when both uh, lines of activity are uh, done. Okay, so that's a thing that you can express with an activity diagram. Okay, now here's one um, in which um, uh, it, it, this is a branch and a merge. Um, uh, this may be a uh, this may be some kind of a repetitive loop. 
I forget what this is exactly. It's possible to show a looping activity. Okay. And then lastly, okay, one of the things that you can do, and this is very popular with activity diagrams and consistent with how we're going to be using it in my course in the current semester, is you can show uh, for various actors what part of the process they do. Okay, so here we're showing that the customer is doing all these. Uh, then we've got um, that the scanning is going to be done by the cashier and the bag items is going to be done by the bagger. In the context that we're going to be using these activity diagrams with swim lanes is we're going to show um, we're going to show who the user actors are and what they do and then we're going to show uh, who the system actor is and what they do. Okay, so um, now who the system is. A system actor is actually technically a, a whole different thing. But um, so uh, these are uh, kind of all the symbols. And again, when you when you put these things into lanes to say who is uh, taking on this action or responsibility, we call these swim lanes because they look like the swim lanes in a lap pool. Okay, so if we back up like I promised and take a look at symbols, uh, these are activities. This shows a, a control or object flow. Um, uh, one of the problems with the diagrams is you're not absolutely sure uh, whether the hours are supposed to sh show uh, control like sequence or object flow. Uh, that's a criticism that's been made of activity uh, diagrams. Uh, I think you do best to just have them um, have the hours I I express uh, uh, time. And, and this comes after this, comes after this. Uh, we use the diamonds for uh, decisions and merging. Uh, if we're trying to show objects and object flow, we can use a rectangle. Uh, when we're trying to show parallel activities, uh, the first one where they s s split out is called a fork. And then the one where they come together again is called a join. So this kind of symbol is a fork or a join. Uh, this uh, circle it, it's filled in is called an initial node. That's the start. Um, the activity final is, um, is, is a stop. That's the end. And this final flow is a symbol that I've not really used or taught, but this is a tricky way to say that uh, we're going to be done, and I don't want to draw the line all the way to the end. So uh, if you look at what was going on uh, here, okay, instead of saying uh, if we don't have access to payment, we're going to go all the way to the end and say done, this is a tricky way to say, well, we're done, but I'm too lazy to draw the line all the way uh, to uh, the final node. Okay, so uh, I'm not going to recommend that we use these. Okay, but this is a really expressive uh, uh, diagram. It, it, it can be used for a lot of things. Okay, so let's go up couple more slides and say exactly what the book proposes that we do. Oh, and then there are some some uh, fancy nodes. Um, if you want to show the movement of data, you can use a rectangle to mean a data store. Uh, so now we've got some arrows that have to do with uh, timing potentially some arrows that have to do with the movement of objects, the flow of objects, and maybe some arrows that have to do with the flow of data. Again, um, I think you do best uh, just to use these diagrams to show 
a sequence of activities and not be messing around with either object or a data flow. Um, there's a way to say uh, when things are going to happen, like every morning at 3 a.m. Uh, there's There are ways that you can send a signal. So we're going to inform security. Um, there is a way that you can receive a signal. You can receive an alert. And my general feeling about all of these is that these are uh, kind of fancy things that, um, oh, I, I don't typically teach my students uh, to use because um, they're kind of pushing activity diagrams to it, activity diagramming to its limits. And um, uh, maybe we don't want to be all the way out there at that limit. Um, so uh, here's an activity uh, diagram where they've added object flows. Again, we've got uh, we've got some arrows that are uh, timing, and now we have a dash line that has that's a data flow. Now we have a dash line here that's a data flow. Uh, that's an interesting idea, but in my experience, which is pretty long, I've been using these diagrams for oh, 15 years or uh, something like that, certainly 10. Um, using these uh, diagrams to show more than just a sequence of uh, actions or events uh, kind of always leads to heartache. So it, when you look at these and say, oh, geez, I can express all these things, uh, what tends to happen is that it's it's a letdown. Um, uh, so again, I coach my students to, uh, 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 you know, we wouldn't add these enhancements uh, to the uh, diagram. Uh, and then signals, I uh, wouldn't use those either. Um, I'm from the, I'm from the, uh, um, uh, I believe that um, these uh, diagramming uh, tools work well when you use them in a basic way. And the more you push them, uh, the harder they are to read. Okay, now current state activity diagram. Okay, sort of implicit in this uh, chapter, and, and what, I, what I really do want you to question is um, this idea that we'll create activity diagrams um, that are going to uh, describe the current business operations that we're interested in. So we're going to fully document the current state. And then we're going to fully document the, the new state with the new solution. OK. And then, uh, and then we're going to say to ourselves, well, what, what do we have to transform? OK, what uh, business processes are we going to have to change? Um, uh, what, what uh, you know, what uh, systems are we going to have to change and or build, okay? And it's really appealing to think of uh, this, I'm sorry, I wanted to go to the, the current uh, state. I'm having a hard time going from, yeah. Uh, it's really, it's really appealing that, um, that you would think that you could document the current state, but it does. And if you have a decent size system uh, project, drawing out the 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 entire process using activity diagrams, uh, these could be pretty big. I mean, we used to, uh, we used to draw uh, diagrams 
like these where you see things called uh, data flow diagrams and we sort of use them like activity diagrams so um, they're supposed to show uh, data flow uh, but we used to do these things for a whole business uh, process when I was in uh, management uh, consulting and we would uh, we'd have just like yards and yards and yards of paper so we would have a diagram like this and when we printed it out on uh you know sort of copier paper it would go all around the walls of a conference room so the flow would be 50 feet long 60 feet long uh something like that and then, of course, uh, the idea was that we would change it and we would come up with the new one. Well, how long would that be? Would that be 50 feet long? Would that be 80 feet long? Uh, so this, this idea that you can kind of comprehensively diagram the current environment and then consp comprehensively diagram the new one, uh, it's an interesting idea, but um uh it's a trip down a rabbit hole from my own personal experience and the experience that i've seen other people uh have on uh projects so why did i take the time to talk about this well i think activity diagrams are good for uh two kinds of things that that we would consider in my course the first one is they're a great way to as you're talking to stakeholders about how things work in their world that it's a great way to be able to sketch these out and say i hear you telling me it's currently working like this okay and they'll say oh no 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 you're missing this or put that over there or yeah that happens sometimes but not all the time so they're a great, um, you know, something we haven't really talked about in this uh, chapter and um, is, I think, an important emphasis. Uh, if you're going to understand what's going on within the, the organization and you're going to understand their problems or their opportunities, uh, then you're going to have to talk to people about the details of what they do. Um, words are good. But pictures help. So I propose that uh, one should have this uh, activity diagramming as a way to clarify uh, when we're talking with stakeholders either about what the current environment does what the current state is like or the future state that we desire but that we should just use these as vignettes uh, to talk about a part of the process i can tell you firsthand if you try to draw a, a an activity diagram about a whole business process uh, you will get a diagram that goes all the way around all the walls of the conference room at least once okay uh, but that doesn't say that you can't diagram individual parts when you're trying to enhance communication with your client, okay? The other thing that we're going to use it for is when we get to use uh, cases in a, a couple more uh, chapters, we're going to show how you can take a narrative of how the system is going to work to help the user solve their problem we're going to say that you can take a particular scenario of that use case and uh, illustrate it with an activity uh, diagram it's the same diagram um, they have the same parts but yeah uh, again it's for a particular use case and it's um, it's feasible to draw a diagram that big uh, okay and the way that we're going to use it uh, it's an optional diagram so uh, if you're writing a use case specification 
and you have one of, of um, the scenario narratives is hard to follow um, in its textual version, you can create a diagrammatic uh, version. So um, in the fall of 2021, that's how we're going to be using activity diagrams. That said, um, you as a systems analyst should be aware of activity diagrams and uh, you, should, you, should, you should have it as a tool that you can always pull out um, and uh, if only at the whiteboard when you're talking to people about how things actually work. So they're really expressive, um, they're really helpful. Um, this sort of activity where we're going to exhaustively document the current state and then we're going to uh, exhaustively document the future state, I'll assure you that we don't have time for that. Okay, and again, from first in experience. Uh, that brings us to the summary. Uh, let's see, there's a couple of good ideas here. Um, so uh, there's a linkage between organizational goals and strategies. Uh, and that's important for the system. And, and there's, you know, there should be a linkage between that and any IT related project that's going to go on. So if you're going to be proposing projects or you're going to be advocating for your project, it's really going to be helpful for you to understand how that project links back to uh, the operations that it's going to change, the tactics that it uh, um, uh, operationalizes, the business model that the tactics support and then the strategy that the business model is um, realizing, right? And the more that you, you understand how what you're proposing or advocating for ties into this whole thing, um, the, better, uh, the better advocate that you're going to be for your uh, project. And the rest of these things just kind of review uh, the rest of the project, uh, the rest of the chapter. I'll leave them there for you to read. Okay, so uh, that's it for this uh, chapter. I'm going to say bye until next time. Bye bye.